Does a real Christian ever ponder abandoning the faith? Hi, my name is Ted Rosenblatt, and I'm here with my father, Dr. Rod Rosenblatt, and this is Talks with Dad Rod. This is kind of an odd question from some, some people's perspective, I think. But it's funny how there are, there are those in the Christian community that can kind of swerve into this subject matter. Sort of, I get a little frustrated with them, and I'm defensive of others who are in struggle when I'm in these conversations. Sure. But the conversation, when, when, when Christians are going through certain trials and tribulations and difficulties and struggles in the faith, is this something they, that, that should shock them? if they experience this. Really shouldn't. Uh, in the New Testament, First Peter and Hebrews. Hebrews written to Jewish Christians who were considering during, during a time of persecution and going back to Judaism because it was going better for them. But we learn from the New Testament that this is something that is uh, not weird for external reasons or internal reasons. Now, if it has to do with internal reasons, what I've found in conversation over and over again is that nobody has ever trained them in why Christianity is true. And again, I use the same reference point all the time. Dr. Montgomery's series, audio series, Sensible Christianity, it's the best intro to a Christian apologetics you can get. It is technically what's called evidential, and uh, to somebody like me with a background in the sciences, that, that one hits the nail on the head. So we have that available. Um, get that, because it could be that nobody's ever trained you as to why the faith is true. So with that taken into account, we, we have places in Scripture where we see uh, be faithful believers, we'll say uh, John, the you know, questioning from prison whether Jesus is the one that was foretold. Send somebody to ask him. Moments of doubt. <clears throat> yep. Are you the one? When you have Peter being like, no, no, Lord, I will be there for you. I will never abandon you. <laughs> and, and, and Jesus is like, you're going to do it in a few minutes, dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Before, <laughs> the, before the cock crows. I don't know if he told him it was going to be three times. I yeah, you'll remember. deny me three times. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, in just, in just a matter of hours, you're going to do it three times. Yeah. No, no, no. But we we have these moments where we aren't sure if this is... And of course, and part of that, obviously, I think at that point for Peter, is watching what Jesus is about to go through. Sure. And part of me is like, have you not been listening? He's been yeah. telling you. <laughs> right. But, and, but that's and what we do. And he towers before a teenage girl. Well, because, you know, <laughs> think about it. You're a Galilean, aren't you? Are you one of his? Well, a teenage girl would be the first to go, I found one. <laughs> yeah. You know, it would make sense <laughs> because, because you know, you, you don't want to get ratted out because those guys are on fire to grab anybody and everybody. They were seeking them out. It was go time. Yep. It would have been very easy to swoop up Peter and stand him right next to Jesus and do the same thing to both of them. Yep. And think about that. Jesus let him escape so that only Jesus took that. Yeah. And you get that in scripture. It was foretold. I, you know, the, the, the shepherd will be struck and the, and the sheep will scatter. Yep. Uh, yep. We, we seem to have this thing in our minds that we won't have moments of doubt in, tribu in, our, in our struggle. Mm -mm. At, even at the point of, is this true? Yep. Or this is just too heavy. Yep. I just don't know if I can do this anymore. Yep. All of that we should expect and sort of school ourselves in it before it comes to pass, it takes place. This, this is normal Christianity for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. One of the struggles that we have in, in the, the message that we like to create for ourselves that is along the lines of getting our best life now or something like that is that, is that old Adam would like to take a religion like this, any religion, but take the religion 
and turn it into the new winning system. This is, if you do the thing, then look at all the great life you can have now and all the great stuff you can have. And You know, I, I've heard those guys, the Osteens of this world, and I think, what in the world do you do, do with the passages, and there are many of them, that if you belong to me, there's going to be trouble. I mean, it's over and over and over again. Expect trouble. If you're mine. Yeah, my, my rhetorical throwaway is expect your worst life now. Yeah. What did they do with those verses? They just ignore them? But we, and that, that sort of builds on it. Those things go like this and make it even more, it, it increases the struggle. Sure. If, if those noises are going on, because if my life isn't like that, yeah. I believe in Jesus. I, I'm struggling with my, with my sin. I feel like I'm doing better this month than I was last month with that. <laughs> and it seems like my life just continues to be difficult. My children are struggling with this, that, and the other thing. We've got financial struggles. Yep. I just, I don't feel like we're winning at almost anything. I've had some, we've had some familial divide and we're arguing deaths in our family. In, deaths in the family. Deaths in the family. There's any number of things that continue on. The, the, the you know, I'm getting slammed for taxes. I might lose my house. Yep. I just lost my job. Yep. I'm having that work three jobs. There's all this daily life stuff. And it's so easy under the burden of all the very true and real difficult daily bread type of scenarios that we got to deal with to look at this and go, how is this not just one more stat, uh, you know, a, a, a straw a piece of straw on the stack. I am so tired. Yep. I'm going to quote a famous reformed writer here. Calvinist writer. Bunyan, Pilgrim's Progress. And if you read nothing else in Pilgrim's Progress, read the part where he has to go through the river at the end. <clears throat> but the Lord says to him, fear not, that is, I'm going through the river with you. And when he comes out on the other side, some of that is some of the greatest English prose you will ever ever read when he comes out on the other side. <clears throat> Men accompany him on every side, help him to unbuckle his armor. Every bell in the church cathedral is ringing to welcome him. Powerful, powerful piece of prose. We can't, and we need those images. Yeah. We need those images because they're true. Yeah. They're true rhetorical storytelling that, that points in the right, it points in the direction of the truth. Right. This is not scripture, is, it's not God's word, but they point in the direction of the truth. He was not an educated man at all, but he knew the scriptures really well. Well, the imagery of that sort of thing is simple. St. George and the dragon. These are, these are, yeah. these are, these are easy. Yep. These are kids stories. These yep. are not complex, yep. philosophical, you know, large yep. diatribes. Yep. These are kids books. 18 pages or something, little things you read to your son or your daughter as they're going to sleep. And we should be. We need lots of these little stories. Sure. Dad went out and slayed the dragon, and all, and all peace was restored to the kingdom. Yeah. Yeah. He comes back, and he's weary and bloodied and singed, and all, and all is made right. Yep. And the kids go, yay, Dad's home. Yep. It's that kind of, we need that kind of imagery because it is the faintest shadow of the truth of the gospel yep. and, and what Jesus himself has done and does for yep. us. Yep. Narnia. Read Narnia, the Narnian Chronicles. They're not just for children. I just recommended that to a father recently who has kids in, you know, uh, preteen, almost about, to, almost about to become teens and teenagers. And I said, there is no age limit on right. father reading Narnia to his children. Right. If you got a kid who's 20s yeah. in your house, make him sit there, shackle him to the thing, and he'll yeah. be like, I don't want to do this. And you're like, you will sit there and listen to Narnia. Be quiet. <laughs> and that, you know, you're going to accept this, this ridiculously joyful thing right now. Yeah. I know this doesn't make sense to you. It doesn't need to make sense to you right now. Right. 
you 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 need something what was that one line there it's a throwaway and it's not really a christian one but it, there is more in heaven and earth than is that is born in your philosophy or whatever yep. it is and and sometimes we need our philosophies shaken up with something that good and our storytelling these days is not good no it's a mess it's yep. getting worse yep. and i think it has to get worse before it gets better I do. I am optimistic that we are going to end up entering a sort of another renaissance where we can get back to amazing storytelling again. But we're not there yet. And, and we feel it when the light has been dimmed, when that light has been dimmed. Mm -hmm. Read about Aslan on the stone table, the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. But dad, that's straight allegory. You can't <laughs> no, do that. No, no, it's myth. <laughs> <laughs> I got I got a BCS Lewis in the room for a moment. Or I mean, uh, I mean Tolkien. Tolkien was the one arguing against that. Yeah. Um, I think I think we need allegory. I think it makes sense, more sense if we if we if we do our storytelling so that it's two separated. Yeah. We we kind of we, we we create Dungeons and Dragons. Out of that <laughs> and characters <laughs> and uh that's fine that's all well and good but it's easy for us as, as sinners to say nah that's not christian so as, when uh, tolkien himself says this is an inherently christian work yeah everybody goes nah the, <laughs> the author doesn't know what he's talking about about his own work well they saw a myth lewis and and tolkien saw a myth in a good way uh, not like Boltmann and the stupid German critics, uh, but they saw it in a good way and were retrieving something that was sort of asleep for a long time. And so it was myth that they were attempting. Now, I, saw, I know we're kind of wandering through this and, and this sort of tangential to the original question, but the point is, is that we are given these gifts that return light into the room when darkness seems to be over yeah, shadow right. is sort of overcoming it. The, the the light is dimming and the shadow is right is is strengthening into the room. Yep. And and you kind of need to to blow the flame again of light and 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 get this thing going again because because the darkness is about lying about the light. And it gets us to believe these little things going on in us when we're struggling. Why does it seem like somebody else, it's, the faith is easy for them and it seems so difficult for me? Well, shadow comes in on that and, and, it, and, it, and it lies to you. And this is something that the little voice in ourselves that tells us little bit by little bit by little bit, the reason that it's harder for you is because yeah. your moral failings. You, have, you aren't doing it, and you aren't doing it at the level of or else. And because you aren't doing it at the level of or else, you might end up casting yourself in or some in unbelief or any number of things unwittingly. It, it, there are all these doubts, and they all seem to have that same sort of sound. Yep. And the, and the stories take us out of that. Yep. The Psalms take us out of that. They let us speak directly to God. His own words. His own words. Yep. That he gives to us to speak to him. Yep. He likes that. He likes, like a, like a parent teaching a child how to form their first words, he likes giving us the words to say so that we can say the words that he wants us to, that, that uh -huh. he has given us to say. Mm -hmm. God receives his own words well. Yeah. Because they are faithful and true. Yep. Yep. It's, it's, just, it's a matter of us being directed in a good direction when we're all seemingly enveloped in darkness and he provides for us that way the promises and the words of scripture and the centrality of christ and the it is finished on our behalf and be of good cheer and be of good cheer and when you come into the be of good cheer place and you believe that that father is in the in the christmas good christmas spirit that we yep should be getting every season and it gives you that sense about the faith then you can kind of sit there and just be his be his 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 child that plays around and makes a mess on the floor and he's very pleased to, to let you make a mess on his floor yep yep and you're okay yep and it's those children that know they're okay who have the most they just are messing around and make causing the biggest ruckus they're they're safe they aren't worrying about what comes next yep 
It's the way it should be. Isn't that what the stories give us? They do. Ah, here and there and further up and further in. <laughs> so I uh, hope this is helpful and fun. Come to 1517.org for more, and we will see you on social media. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you for joining us on Talks with Dad Rod, part of the 1517 Podcast Network. This podcast and all 1517's content is made possible through financial support by listeners just like you. Please visit 1517.org for more, and please consider clicking on the donate button and making a recurring or one-time contribution to help us share this good news in a world which so desperately needs it. <laughs>